on the head. And I think I mentioned last week that this last attribute is probably the one no, most by people, although they may not understand the significance of it. And when I say attribute, of course, you know I mean that an attribute of God. And it's simply God is love, 1 John 4, verses 8 and 16, 1 John chapter 4, 8 and 16. On down in the lesson, I'll be giving you some more scriptures like I've done before. And I will mention again, let me encourage you to uh, take time working into your day some way to go back through and read these scriptures and think about them in connection with the proof text. Uh, what is what they are proof texting. So when we talk about God is love, we can we can say it this way. Love is who God is and what God does. Love is who God is and what God does. So in our efforts as is with this whole study and each component part of it to attempt to comprehend the nature of, of love. I guess we can say the is and the does just can't be separated. Again, I'll emphasize love truly is an attribute of God. But love is an attribute of God that is, I think, best understood by its action and observation and not merely discussion. Let me give you what I mean by that, and I'll reference it again later on. How do I understand how God is love? Well, God is love but love is god in action for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so it's questionable whether love can be given serious thought and a lot of contemplation in an abstract way for love is best conceived as an activity, not as a static state of God's nature. It doesn't mean it's not a part of his nature. That's not the point. Remember God, when we talk about the Godhead, when we talk about God, we're talking about the one deity, the one eternal divine essence from which flows the nature of God, and we see his nature and what he is by the attributes we're studying. So we can very well say love is made known by its deeds. Love is made known by its deeds, or we know love by its deeds. When you notice the King James Version in 1 Corinthians 13 talking about charity, well, we today use charity really when it refers to deeds done to people who really can't help themselves. I've always liked charity to best explain what love is, and since God is love, to help explain God. And let me pause here and interject this. When you think of the other attributes we've studied, realize that in the very essence of deity, this eternal essence without beginning or ending, the uncaused first cause of all things, that all of these attributes work together. They're not independent of one another in the sense of you study one and it's exclusive of the others, etc. They all are just part of the essence of God. So love acts. And thus we're taught by Jesus, he said to the apostles, in Luke, uh, or rather John 14, verse 15, if you love me, American Standard Version 1901 translates it, you will keep my commandments. So if, 
if you respond with the agape love, which seeks another's highest good, then it's seen by your actions. And so it is the agape love that seeks our good, that is God, then his love is seen by his actions. So in this sense, the love of God and the acts of God are inseparable. So we again say that love is comprehended more by observing what love does than by being told what love is. And that's an important point. That's the same way it is with us as we seek to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and put into practice what it is to be a Christian. Then how do we understand that a Christian, remember it means of Christ, Christian means of Christ. Then how do we know we love and we're emulating God in that love? because you can see it in our actions. You can see it as Christians worship. Well, let's just back up and say it this way. You see, when we say whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3, 17. And love is seen in its actions. Then it'd be ridiculous to say, I love the Lord, but I really don't go about putting into practice what he teaches me to do. So I'll, I'll repeat myself and say love is understood more by observing what it does than by being told what love is. But there's something else that needs to be emphasized here along that line. Love not only acts, it must act. Now think about that for a moment. Love not only acts, it must act. It wouldn't be loved if it didn't act. So action is a part of love. It can't be separated from the act. This may sound a bit funny, but it's uh, in the sense of peculiar, but a short statement, love cannot not act. Love cannot not act. It wouldn't be love if it didn't act. So to fail to act is to reveal the absence of love in our lives. Again, love reveals itself in your life and my life in obedience to God. Thus you see why again Ecclesiastes would say the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. All that is in direct application or evidence of our love being like God's love because we act. So this affords insight into the very necessity of man's redemption. Remember, redeem means God has done something to purchase us from the condemnation of sin. God didn't put us in that position. We did. So this gives us insight into the necessity of redemption. The necessity not only is to be found in the moral state of man, but also in the very nature of God. And that's the point we're making right now. God must redeem because God is love. And that even makes John 3, 16 even more so, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God does what he does because he's love. Love in action. Again, let me give you some more passages. I've cited John 3, verse 16, but also put with that Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Ephesians 5, verse 2. Chapter 5, verse 2. 
in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Now, I want to mention the epistles of John since we're talking about this. When we when you go back through and read, it doesn't take long to do that. Uh, all three epistles of John, but also especially the first epistle. Do so with what we're studying tonight in mind. God does what God does because he is, a, he is, he is love. He is love in action. You can't have the love of God and not have the action of love. It all just works that way. So God's love reaches beyond God. It reaches outside of himself to his creation. Again, notice John 3, 16, God loved the world. Now, don't get mixed up where John says to Christians, don't love the world, because their world means the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. But when it is said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he means lost humanity. Men who chose to rebel against him by sinning and do as they please, regardless of the good God did for us. So God loves the world. And John uses that again, as he did in John 3, 16, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. 1 John 4, 16. So out of this love means God determined to save us from our sins. And that love did not wait till we turned to love him. He loved us, as he says, even in our sins. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, what's interesting, knowing that God is eternal, thus he is love and thus love's eternal, and love always acts and it acts outside himself, that means regarding mankind, he was never without a plan. And that plan is constant and it's eternal. Now, does that give us insight into the new heavens and new earth after this world's over, after we've been resurrected and we're in the likeness of Christ? Yes, it tells me because God doesn't change. He's immutable. It tells me he has a plan for us in the sinless world to come. That's sort of thrilling to me. Uh, I don't know what's involved in it. The Bible is very silent about things like that. Not much said, not much revealed. Yet, I can from understanding about God, and in this case, God is love, love is action, know that he had a plan, and since God's eternal, it's always been in God. And thus, since he doesn't change, then I know as he has a scheme of redemption plan, a plan of salvation for men today, then he has a plan after this whole system's over and done with for those who are resurrected to eternal life. So even now, this plan pertaining to the forgiveness of our sins and getting us into heaven, the implementation of the plan is anchored in God's love. And therefore, whatever he has planned for us in the next world, it's anchored in God's love. That's amazing to me. I find few words properly express the reality of that, that he has a plan because love has a plan. Love is an action, an action of man's a plan. He's eternal, he's immutable. Thus, he has a plan for us when this whole worldly episode is over and done with. So God's love flows from what he is. Now think about what we've been studying about him and know that that all is involved in God's love. So it flows from what he is and from who he is. Remember when we studied about the one divine essence, the one God who inhabits eternity, then we're studying who he is. We're studying what he is. We do so 
by the attributes flowing from his nature, which nature comes from the very essence of his being. So it's what the divine essence is. It manifests the divine, the divine essence. That uh, is manifested. What's amazing to me is that while we can't begin to comprehend him, we can't understand enough. Um, when you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, first, second, and third persons of the Godhead, what do we see? We see love. Well, the best way to see them, Jesus said, when you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, then I've seen love. If you want to see the agape love that seeks the ultimate and the highest good, of which there's no higher, just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and take note of Jesus' actions. The very fact that he came to earth and became a man, well, that's love, love and action. So in the three, you see that God loves. You see that he loves, and you see that which is love, and you see love. And it goes so much farther than what most people think of love. We tend to be bound up in emotionalism. And that kind of thing handicaps us, really. People let their family ties, their emotional ties, or whatever, actually move them to violate God's will or to try to show respect of persons. Let's put it this way, where nothing is loved, there's no love. Now think about that when it comes to the reason behind God's creation of man. Remember what we said about love as a plan? So in the creation of man, God had a plan, and he has a plan. It's all tied together because he loves us which therefore means he gave, gave his son, and thus he's authored a plan whereby we can participate in that love, the love of God, the agape love, the love that always seeks another's highest good. So God is love. Now what's interesting about this is that remember, God's not a human. The one divine essence is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And thus, God is love. The one divine essence is love. And they love one another. They don't need anything. We humans need a lot. And we probably, I know we do. We think we need a lot that we don't need. But the Father needs nothing. You can't make him any more God than he is. You can't take away from anything and make him lesser God. He is what he is. Does that echo what God said to Moses at the bush? I am that I am. So the father loves the son, the son is loved, and so the Holy Spirit. And Paul mentions that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. So where the Trinity is, Love is. Love, therefore, we may conclude, originates from within and not without. Its um, impetus resides within God's own essential character. It has nothing to do with the circumstances of his creation, with the spiritual creation or natural creation just what God is. It's his nature. And he has that nature because of what he is, his divine essence. It's love. He loves because of who or what he is. And again, this is the uh, agape love. A love based upon the lover, not the love. Did you get that? God is love. Make a difference what you do or I don't do. God is still love. 
make any difference who's lost or who's saved. God is love. And God is seen, or the, his, the fact that he is love is seen in his actions. God is love, so of course he's going to love the sinner. So God loves us because God is love and because God is who he is. So in a world that only knows lust as a way of living, the one who is a faithful member of the Lord's church, the Christian, the child of God, the citizen of the kingdom of heaven, who's faithful, is loved, and can love and can develop that love. How do I know how to love God loves? Well, the simplest way is to keep doing what God tells you and your character is molded in his likeness. But you can't do that and not obey him. We just don't see the fact that as we live our lives striving to obey all his commandments because we love him and our love manifests itself in obeying him, we don't understand how that's shaping and molding our very inward man, our very spirits in the likeness of Christ. Love is used in a consistent manner when it is talking about God in the New Testament. And as simply as I can put it, it's an unselfish affection or attribute that is self giving. Now watch this. Being that it is self-giving means or implies a cost. You remember David saying, I will not give to the Lord that which cost me nothing. And look at what God gave to save us. That's what love does. So when you see Christ teaching us, he says, he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. And then notice love demonstrated what he meant because he then washed the disciples' feet. Now in that day and time, when people wore sandals and walked virtually everywhere, feet got very dirty. And it was considered a lowly task to wash people's feet, but it was considered an um, act of hospitality and concern on the part of a host, but it usually re relegated to the slave. And Jesus is showing the disciples that if you'll be great in the sight of God, it'll be the when you exercise love, but love implies a cost, and that means service. And thus, when you read in the New Testament about service, you should involve helping people, many people that can't help themselves. Thus, there's the benevolent aspect of the work of the church. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the widows and orphans and their afflictions and to keep oneself in spot from the world. James 1, verse 27. So you see benevolence, that's the idea of charity. Charity is love and action. And of course, we're always following the will of God because this kind of love says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this is the essence of divine love. If you want to see the divine love living in you or me, it'll be in obedience to his will and active in those things that cost us something. So not only does God's love act, it acts even though it's costly to act. Now think about Christ and think about that cost. It helps us understand you can't outgive God. Yet if you remove giving from Christianity, you destroy Christianity because it's anchored in God's love. And love is willing to sacrifice. Sacrifice is not just giving something. It's giving something that costs you something. You give up something. And you're more than willing. It 
it does uh, show itself in that way or reveal itself in that way in the individual's life. Love will sacrifice. That's all there is to it. So the main focus of God's love and God's loving activity is the cross. Maybe that helps us understand better in that act of worship known as the Lord's Supper, why we're taught to commemorate his death till he come again. That's commemorating what the ultimate and what God gave that proves his love to save us. And we can commune with God as you worship him in spirit, right attitude, right motive, and truth as the truth directs us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, that's not to make it a greater thing than any other act of worship God authorizes. Because when you consider the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, when you consider our prayers, when you consider the study of the Bible, all of it fits. So God so loved that he gave. And the giving cost, well, it meant the only begotten son. He was given up in, in death, John 3, verse 16. The just for the unjust, Peter said in 1 Peter 3, 18. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. So because God is love, he acts. If he did not act, he would not be loved. You can't divorce the two. And if we're members of the spiritual body of Christ, then when we love, we act. If we have the love that he had, the agape love. So his love, God's love, is demonstrated supremely in the sacrifice of Christ. Romans 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Love is the self-giving of God. Now, let me pause here and say, does that help us see why this false view of love that governs so much is so far from what the love of God is because God is love and love gives, and it cannot help but give. It cannot help but act. It cannot help but act sacrificially, and we're to walk in the footsteps of Christ in, in doing that. So love not only acts, not only must act, not only arises from within, that is from the nature of God, which nature is from the essence of God, and not only is sacrificial, but notice that love takes the initiative. Love doesn't wait. Let me say that again. We're summing up what we're studying about love here. Love acts, but it not only acts. And it not only must act, and it not only arises from within the very nature of God, and it's not only sacrificial, but love takes the initiative. It takes the first step. It's not sought, but it seeks. It doesn't um, wait to be implored and wait for man. Let's put it in that perspective. Man's lost. Man's lost because he chose to sin. God didn't wait and say, well, I'll wait till they ask me to come save them. No, he took the first step. Listen now, Paul put it in Romans 5, 8. While we were still or yet sinners, Christ died for us. So divine love searches for the lost sheep. It finds the lost sheep. And it carries it to the sheepfold. Luke 15, 4 through 7. Luke 15, 4 through 7. So Jesus didn't come because he was called. Rather, he came to call, Matthew 9, 13. He came to call sinners to repentance. So it was God, the one eternal divine essence, who sent forth his son to redeem. The purchase of his blood 
from our sins. Paul deals with that in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. So I guess you could say he was an uninvited person who came to seek our highest good while we were yet in rebellion to him. And he willingly died to redeem us. Now, that gets into the gospel, the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. That's why the church, those who have heard the gospel, believed and obeyed it, are Christians, practicing this love, learning it. That's why we go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We don't wait to be called. We go out and announce the glad tidings. So this was because of his great love with which he loved us, Ephesians 2, 4, that he took the initiative to save us. So let me emphasize that. Love takes the first step. Love makes the first move. Love takes the initiative. Now, let me move over and, and emphasize, and I'm just tying these things together that we've already been emphasizing and studying uh, the whole subject, especially for the attributes. God's love is an everlasting, it's eternal love. Jeremiah 31, 3. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, and Romans 8, verses 35 to 39. Romans 8, 35 through 39. It's not whimsical. It's not fickle. It's not dependent upon situations or circumstances. It's not dependent upon human conduct. The love of God endures. It continues. Nothing can stop it. And it endures, you know, to endure something means usually it's painful or unpleasant, and so you put up with it. So love endures tribulation, it endures distress, it endures persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and we can say the sword. It's already been pointed out many times that Paul told Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And yet over and over again, one way or the other, to one extent or the other, the Bible comes at us saying that if you'll endure to the end, you'll be saved. Bear up under this. When you know the truth and you know you're living in harmony with the truth, then you're manifesting your love back to God. And regardless of the tribulation, the distress, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the peril and sword that comes upon you because you're a faithful child of God, that doesn't change a thing with God. So in, in, in the midst of all these things, Paul wrote Romans 8, 37, Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's the very idea presented by Paul to the church at Rome in Romans 8, 37. No one or no thing is able to separate us from the love of God. The only person that can separate anyone from the love of God is that person who decides not to love God and keep his commandments. The love of God can't be stopped. It cannot be weakened. As I've said several times already, it's immutable. It's unchanging. Now think about that when it comes to our living the Christian life and all the things we go through. And just being a human being in the process of life in the flesh. Besides being persecuted to one degree or the other, and one way or the other, because you love God, keep his commandments. Look at the comfort, the consolation, and the peace, and the great assurance that we have if we keep doing what's right. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Why is that passage so important? 
because of what we're saying here, the Bible teaches about God is love and all of that means. Our lives are under the providential care of the Holy God who loves us with an everlasting love. I like to think of it as when you consider all the laws that God spoke into existence, the laws, uh, should say natural laws, that he spoke into existence. Well, why do they keep working? Because he wills it to be so. He upholds it by the word of his power. Well, that's the same God that controls all things for the good of his people who love him and serve him. It doesn't change. The intensity of God's love is unchanging. His love is his essence. And in his essence, God is constant. Take a look in the Old Testament at Joseph, son of Jacob, or Israel. And also look at Job, Joseph and Job. Joseph and Job are both loved with the same love and loved in the same way. There's no distinction. However, the effect of God's love and the lives of those he loves is different. Look at the two men and their lives. God's love ordained that some suffer more than others. For some, life is relatively easy, or at least more so than others. But with others, it's filled with great affliction and trial, tribulation. Well, I hear this raises the question, does this suffering bring into question God's love? You hear it all the time with people Every time there's a catastrophe of some sort or the other, you'll hear somebody say, why did God do this to us? Well, I've done this and I've done that, usually meaning I've served God. And why did God let this happen to us? But let me say again, when you look at Job, when you look at Joseph, they're loved in the same way by the same God because God is love. The sufferings may vary, but the divine love is constant. And since God has a plan, and since God knows each one of us through and through, then he knows what we need in his providential care as we serve God in his family on earth. Have you as a parent maybe talking to other parents, or you've heard it said over the years. But well, we had to just really stay close and really had to practice a lot of discipline and corrected discipline with one of our children. But you know, so-and-so, the other child or one of the or other children, it wasn't that difficult with them. Well, if we as weak mortals can see that among our own children and we love them the same, Yet we had to inflict much more discipline maybe on one than another. Then why do we think it's so different with God who loves us in the same way? But yet some of us have to undergo a lot more than others do. Maybe that's a poor way of our trying to understand it with our human finite minds, but we can. We shouldn't blame God because he loves all of us the same way. So this is true, though there's no way to compare Joseph's suffering to that of Job. Just think about it for a while. I'm not saying Joseph didn't suffer, but when you compare Joseph's suffering to that of Job, not the same. Job suffered in a much more intense way than Joseph did. So because the intensity is constant, it would be improper, it would be wrong to say that God loved Joseph more than Job because Joseph suffered less. 
God just simply does not have favorites as men do who are fickle and vacillating. All of God's children are loved with an everlasting love. So the prophet Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3, Jeremiah 31 verse 3, God's children, all of them are loved with an everlasting love. Now, if you belong to God because you loved his commandments and you obeyed the gospel and you're his, you'll benefit from his love as much as anybody can. And so will everybody else who's faithful to God. His love for you never increases. We can't comprehend what it means to be objects of such affection. We can just wonder at it and be more determined than ever to accept our lot in life, whatever it may be, and make sure we're obedient to God to the best of our ability. Now, closely related to God's love is his goodness. How could you separate God's love from his goodness? But it's not just his goodness. God being love, love in action, has to do with his goodness, his grace, his mercy, and his patience. I'm going to give you several scriptures concerning <laughs> God's goodness. Nahum, the Old Testament, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. Nahum 1, 7. Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 34, verse 8. Psalm 86, verse 5. 86, verse 5. Psalm 119, verse 68. Psalm 119, verse 68. Psalm 145, verse 9. Psalm 145, verse 9. Mark chapter 10, verse 18. Mark chapter 10, verse 18. And the last one, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. Now, God's goodness then, in the light of these scriptures, expresses the fact that he's good. That's why you'll hear me say many times, good as the Bible defines good. God is good in his very essence. And that his love is unfailing. He cares for all creation. For the love for the Lord is good to all. Psalm one forty five nine. One of the passages I gave you. He is benevolent. We've talked about benevolence already. The idea of how we use charity today. But notice he sends the rain and the sun and all things pertaining to the needs of this life sustaining and providing for all creation. And Acts 14, 17, Paul said, he fills our hearts with food and gladness. Acts 14, 17. Going back to Psalm 107, verse 8. Psalm 107, verse 8. <clears throat> oh, that men would give thanks to God for his goodness. God's grace, remember grace means favor. As it relates to our salvation, it means favor we cannot merit, we do not deserve, we cannot earn. God's grace, 1 Peter 5, 10, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, is his unmerited love or favor that contemplates man in his guilt because he chose to sin, and determines to redeem him from his sin. <clears throat> God's mercy. Let me give you some scriptures on God's mercy. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19. Exodus 33, verse 19. Deuteronomy 4, 3. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Chronicles 21, 13. 1 Chronicles 21, 13. 
Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 12. Jeremiah 3, verse 12. <clears throat> Daniel 9, verse 9. Daniel 9, verse 9. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 4. So God's mercy is a virtual synonym, I guess we could say, for his pity and his compassion. It's God's love focused upon man and man's misery and distress, which man brought upon himself as God was doing him good. The Father of mercies, meaning the Father of compassion, has great mercy and love, Psalm 25, 6. Psalm chapter 25 or Psalm 25, 6. And he has mercy on whom he will. Let me give you some verses on that, Exodus 33, 19. Exodus chapter 33, verse 19, and Romans chapter 9, verse 15. Romans 9, 15. Now, look at what we call, we'll like a better way to refer to it, God's patience. God's patience. Here's a number of scriptures. Exodus chapter 34, 6. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. Psalm 86, verse 15. Psalm 86, 15. Psalm 145, verse 8. Psalm 145, verse 8. Nahum 1, verse 3. Nahum chapter 1, verse 3. Romans 2, verse 4. Romans 2, 4. Romans 9, 22. Romans 9, 22. 1 Peter 3, verse 20. 1 Peter 3, verse 20. And 2 Peter 3, verse 15. 2 Peter 3, verse 15. So when we see God's patience, and take note of those verses as, as they're applied to God's patience, God's patience speaks of God being long-suffering, of the fact that he suffers long with the obstinate. He's slow to anger, and therefore he delays his judgment upon man. Interesting, as one observed, that God took six days for creation, but waited seven days before he destroyed Jericho. Now we need to understand this. The atheist looks at the world and says, here's all this trouble going on and pain and anguish, et cetera, et cetera, and reflects on God in a bad way because of that. But he doesn't see it as God bearing with man and not bringing you into final judgment, giving man time to change. Thus, we have 2 Peter 3, 9, concerning the second coming of Christ. The Lord not slack concerning his promise. Some men can slack. But it's long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God is withholding his judgment. And yet people are not realizing that, and they just use time to indulge in sin while God withholds his wrath. And finally, God's love can never be fathomed. I think that's a good place to end in the study of the Godhead because that's where we started. There's all kinds of sermons, lessons, theological treaties written on God. They'll never be able to fully explain it, no matter how true to the book they are. There is a mystery, that which is unrevealed, that cannot be grasped by the mortal finite mind. In other words, how do you comprehend the holy loving the unholy? The cross is the supreme manifestation of God's love for rebellious man. 
But that very manifestation intensifies the mystery. Why? How can you understand the creator dying for the creature? I guess we can say we see, but it's through a, a very dim glass. And I think the best way I can close out this study of the Godhead is to say all we can do is like Thomas did, fall down before the Christ and say, my Lord and my God. That's the noblest response, the most faithful response, that daily we yield our bodies living sacrifices unto God, which is our reasonable service, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and that we worship him as the New Testament teaches. And that leads us then to a song. It was a poem, poem once. What was a song? I think it was written by a man, and I don't know who he is, by the name of Robert Grant. But we know the song, Oh, worship the King all glorious above, and gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor, and girded with praise. Well, I think it's a good place to end our study for the moment. I hope you'll go back and study these and meditate on them and see what all you can get out of them because they weren't meant to be just, I guess you'd say, uh, gone through and forgotten. Every time I go through something like this, it makes a difference. I, I see or I think more about something than I did before. And since we all need to be reminded about everything we've ever learned anyway, <laughs> we, we, you be, can't be reminded too much of this. So we thank everybody for being here, and I know there'll be others who'll go back and look at the recordings, but if you have any questions that come up in, the, in your mind and in the weeks to come, feel free to bring them up. Might be worth a sermon. 